you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Joseph, how are you today? Fine, thanks. And Cara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study and how you are managing your time. OK? Yes. I think so. OK, so I'll start with Cara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socialising? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Cara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way, and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about 10 hours more than the average student a week. Think about it and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at 11.30. OK, good. Come to my office at 11.45 and wait in reception. OK? OK. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socialising through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So, you've managed to integrate well? I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up and before you know it you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late? No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course, during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work, OK? Yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend 90% of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. 
Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before and, well, we went out afterwards and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Information Roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, this is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000, and it's likely to grow, unless we do something. And it's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day 
is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student... ...and being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about AD 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferia, and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about 20 foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks.
Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms. Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising. But you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon, or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis, and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium. With a variety of programs such as aerobics and weight training, if the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative, or speak with sports administration manager, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. Now I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life. As women are prone to osteoporosis, it also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon. Will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach SuperSave supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions such as have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSafe store and open questions such as what would you find helpful about a customer complaint website. I decided to do interviews rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four SuperSafe stores two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff. They just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time but 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face, and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be and act upon them accordingly. SuperSave is already a highly customer-orientated organisation and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites, that there's a lack of access to online computers. Surprisingly, 
In my survey, I found that 88% of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site, but it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight, and in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket. Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain. But also, the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome the constructive criticism and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives, but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four.